So every time, don't start the timer yet. Oh, you can't do that. Come on, cut me some slack, buddy. <laughs> anyway, anyway, every every time every time Levy introduces these topics, you change the ground rules slightly. So uh, that's okay. But uh, I'm not really here to talk about our firm per se. I will share with you some of the things that we're struggling with with respect to this topic: um, integrated practice. So the first question in our mind and that our firm has had to struggle with is, why would anybody do integrated practice? And you can try and come up with answers like, well, you know, maybe you'll make more money or maybe you'll get more work or you can probably come up with a whole bunch of rationale for it. But the one that we have found tends to be the most compelling and the one that, that, that is underlying our drive into this territory is this notion of, increased complexity in the world. What we are finding is that every facet of what our profession has to deal with is trending toward increased complexity. Our clients are becoming more complex, right? It doesn't tend to be the sole business owner that you know, gives you the job on the golf course. It tends to be the committee and the stakeholders. Uh, the environment that we're working in is more complex. Um, as soon as the issues about carbon and, and energy started entering into the equation, design got a lot more complex. Financing has got a lot more complex. So everything about our world has tended to be getting more complex. So from our point of view, integrated design or integrated practice is one way of dealing with this. So you can either run from the complexity or you can embrace it. And we're choosing to embrace it. And from our point of view, that's the basis of why integrated practice makes some sense. What you are doing is bringing together more voices and more perspectives in trying to find creative solutions in response to the fact that it's getting a lot more complex. So why wouldn't you do an integrated practice? And there are a lot of reasons, <coughs> some of which we heard this morning when we asked about whether or not the project that the students were doing involved other disciplines, and the answer was no, right? People are still generally being trained in a traditional siloed model. And so when we get people that come to our firm from that education background, we generally have to untrain them. Because what's happening is, you know, the architectural students have all read Ayn Rand, and they think that they are all powerful, and that everybody should bow before them. The engineers, um, Omid, hold your ears for a minute, are generally trained to smile and, and GF and say thank you, sir, and go back to the office and complain about what an idiot the architect was. Um, so everybody is kind of um, complicit in these set of siloed relationships that are really quite dysfunctional. So that's one reason not to go into it, because you won't find people that are appropriately trained. Other reasons not to do it? Uh, procurement hasn't caught up with this model yet. Generally, procurement methodologies tend to break things down, not to build them up. Another reason not to do it is, frankly, it's a lot of work. So some of you who know our firm, we have 36 principles. You've asked the question, how do you ever make a decision? Well, okay, next topic. Um, <laughs> You've probably all heard these terms, ID, IDP, IPD, PPP, a lot of P's in there. What do they all mean? They all have a role uh, to play in a definition of integrated practice. So I won't go too deep into them. I'm probably on minute seven. Uh, IDP is integrated um, uh, design. Um, IPD um, is integrated project delivery, and PPP is public-private partnership. And what happens in that spectrum is that the IDP tends to revolve around the design team and how they are going to collaborate more effectively. IPD is an attempt to bring the contractor into that mix in a contractual way that frankly we are struggling with in a couple relationships because our clients don't quite get how to do it properly. And then PPP, public-private partnerships, although you've heard me talk about the challenges of that, the one thing that PPP does really well, and again it was brought up this morning, is it's a one methodology that brings operating cost, maintenance cost, and capital cost together. So therefore, 
the best overall solution works. And that model does it, and for that reason, I think it's going to be around for a long time. Here's some other drivers that are, that are influencing integrated practice and driving us that, in that direction. So certainly lead is. It's a whole lot of considerations that, frankly, a lot of architects didn't have to deal with in the past. ASHRAE, I mean, Omid could tell us that ASHRAE is kind of taking over where uh, LEED is left off and the new ASHRAE standards are going to drive us further in that direction. BIM, the whole building information modeling, is an exercise in integrated practice because now the notion of you owning the intellectual property and it's all your world and you can develop it in isolation really is quickly eroding. Uh, social media, P3s, there are a lot of things that are um, that are driving this. There's one other thing that's driving it that's not up here, and that is when we talk to students, what we are finding is that the notion of traditional practice is eroding in the minds of the students that we see. That the notion of an atypical practice, an atypical type of firm is very much in play out there with the people that are going to be our future partners. Okay, so here's some of the things that we have in progress in our firm. Uh, collaboration, you've heard that word a lot. We are trying to drive collaboration to an extremely deep level, starting with the fact that we have 36 principals trying to make decisions in our firm. Everything in our firm is driving in this direction, and frankly, there are some things that work just great about it, and there are some things that are challenges. It is generally harder to have more people involved in the decision than fewer. Communication is another big one. We've just launched our intranet. How many people have an intranet in their firm? Okay, there you go. So we're behind on this one. Um, but what we are doing with this is we are turning it into a repository of the firm's um, intellectual knowledge. We are trying to institutionalize the knowledge that exists in everybody's brain and turn it into a wiki format that everybody can tap into. And so far it's working quite well. Education, um, we are investing heavily in education. Um, we have professional educators on staff. We built our own curriculum. We're involving clients and all sorts of people in it. It's all online um, in our organization. And we're doing this because with integrated practice, we have to put an awful lot of energy into training the people that come to us in this way of working. And therefore, we want to advance our culture and our understanding, so we need our own means of educating. And the last thing um, that, um, that is in progress in our firm is, is a really intense investigation into what space and environment can do in order to drive integrated practice. And again, we have some successes and we have failures. We're always fighting the notion of tribe. Anybody who's in a corner forms a tribe and they want to be left alone. Anytime we take groups that want to be in silos and we break them up and say you need to be in a new location as an integrated team, you know, you always get the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the desire to maintain the umbilical cord to that traditional silo. Um, probably all of you have seen this book, which Craig has been proselytizing um, quite heavily, I understand. I haven't read it, but Craig said to me, quick, open it up to page 61. It's all, it talks all about that, so I'm going to quote from the Bible. It's, this is a study by uh, Stephen, Stephen Johnson. I have no idea who he is. <laughs> he, did, he, did, um, he did a rigorous study, I understand. The, this is his conclusion. The most striking discovery in Dun Dunbar's study turned out to be the physical location where most of the important breakthroughs occurred. Most important ideas emerged during regular lab meetings where a dozen or so researchers would gather and informally present and discuss their latest work. It was the conference table. The most productive tool for generating good ideas remains a circle of humans at a table, the talking shop. So innovation didn't happen over a microscope in the corner. It happened when groups were collaborating and were working in an integrated fashion. How am I doing on time? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. I'm done. Thank you. Mm -hmm.